I'm actually quite enjoying it um, in a rather guilty way. It's rather like sort of enforced retirement. Um, many of the day I've woken up thinking, oh, gosh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do the other, and suddenly finding a day when, you you know, your diary is completely empty. In fact, um, the next month is completely empty. Mm. As Barry Cryer once said, you know, oh, I get snow blindness from looking at my diary. But it, it is so white and empty at the moment. But it means you can do other things at a slightly different pace, which I'm rather enjoying. One, one of the things you've been doing is you've contributed to this book to raise funds for health uh, charities the, on the NHS, about your NHS experiences. Just give us a little glimpse of what you've been saying. Well, I think all the contributors were asked to give their experiences the NHS. Um, I'm fortunate because I haven't had to go to hospital very much during my life, but my piece is really about the the humanity and the humour of my experiences uh, when in the NHS. I think there's a most extraordinary relationship happens between the people who deal with you on the wards and the doctors and yourself. Um, they get to know you at the moment of crisis. There's no sort of gentle build up, oh, we'll call each other the next day. Straight away you're into um, a psychological and emotional relationship with them, just as strong as the medical relationship. So I'm just sort of uh, reminiscing on how humour had helped me when I'd been in hospital. And I remember a wonderful time when I had my appendix out at uh, University College Hospital. And the ward was just a wonderful place to be. It was so friendly. And there was an unfortunate man who'd had an operation for piles, and it was quite painful. And he also had a tremendous sense of humour, and he couldn't resist either telling jokes or asking other people to tell him jokes, and they would cause absolute agony. So he would sort of, ha, 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 ha. Um, And it was just the general feeling in the ward, those two mm. or three crisis days I was there, the, the people who cared for us made us feel as though they were our friends mm. for that brief time. And I think that's a terrific thing that people do in the NHS. Well, of course, medical humour, the humour of doctors is notorious. But you are known to an awful lot of people these days, primarily as one of our great travellers. And I'd just be very interested on your reflections. As people look ahead and realise they're not going to get that summer holiday, they're not going to be able to jump on a plane, and we're going to probably travel less in the future, how should we cope with that? I think you can travel less and travel better, if you know what I mean. I mean, if we have to be confined to travelling um, in the UK, I mean, it's not a bad place to travel. There's all sorts of wonderful places and different landscapes and different sort of atmospheres, northern Scotland, Cornwall. Mm go to places and um, learn more about them, enjoy them more, find out more about your own country. Because I think it's going to be very difficult for, uh, and, uh, for people right across the world to actually um, travel again as they did before. Until we find a vaccine, nobody is going to pack people in airplanes. There's, no, there's going to be no cheap and cheerful flights around the world. It's going to be very, very difficult um, to... Uh, to see mm. the rest of you, the rest of the world. So I think narrow your horizons is not necessarily a bad thing. Look more carefully, look more thoroughly. Um, learn to enjoy your own country, I would say that's it. Traveling is not necessarily exotic. It can be local, but it can still be as, as interesting and inspirational, I think. Michael, um, you're in your 70s. If the government decided to ask all over 70s, all over 70s, to stay in for another 12 weeks, would you regard that as a bit unfair? I would, yes. I think it's uh, it's difficult call every time, but you've got to be more selective here because there are a great deal, a uh, great number of people in, the, in their 70s who are very active, very thoughtful, have got lots of ideas, can contribute um, to um, recovery. And I think that to treat them all as people who, who have to be sort of um, kept out of sight is is going to be very difficult and very wrong and very unfair on a lot of people who want to help and are active and can contribute an awful lot to the growing economy. So, and you know, I, I, I think you've got to be careful. And, of course, there are people even in their 80s who remain very active, which is lucky for you, because I gather you had a bad fire in your kitchen. You were rescued by your 80-something-year-old neighbour. Well, <laughs> well, I have to tell you, actually, this was all a complete uh, piece of fake news. I wrote a comic <laughs> article in a magazine called The Idler about taking it easy after a heart operation. 
and everything was fabricated apart from the heart operation. Um, but someone picked up the story, and, and at one point I was just, it was a chapter accidents rather in the three men in a boat style. And one of which was, I, you know, I was um, doing deep breathing exercises to calm down, blew a piece of paper onto the gas ring. It ignited a Sainsbury's bill. I tried to put it out with a, with a towel. The towel caught fire. Um, and I was rescued by um, an 86-year-old neighbor who just had a, a sextuple heart bypass a week before and I was dragged to safety and someone took this seriously. Oh, <laughs> so you, Michael like Palin, I, like, hmm? Michael Sorry. Palin, I'm horrified uh, and chagrined to realise that Michael Palin is the source of fake news circulating oh, yeah. around the internet. Thank you very, very much indeed for joining us nonetheless.